This is Money Mind with me, Stanley Leong and Susan Ng. Thank you for joining us here on CNA 938. You know, I remember when I got my first job after graduating and, and drew my first paycheck, I was so eager to apply for a credit card. But my parents stepped in and they discouraged me and asked me to get a debit card instead. They wanted me to spend within my means and draw from what was already in my bank account. And for someone who's just starting out, right, they surely didn't want me to buy stuff and then have to pay interest for credit that's extended to me. Um, I don't know if that was the similar experience for you growing up, Sue. Was, was that uh, how you were raised as well? Yeah, I took I guess, direction from my parents, particularly my father, almost all through his life, he would buy things and pay for everything in full. My first credit card was actually a charge card, so I had to pay things in full. <laughs> but, you know, <laughs> these days on top of, but I have to say this, when I got my first job, I did not have a credit card. In those days, it wasn't the thing to do. It was only a couple of years after that. So anyway. Right, before, before the time, huh? Thank you. All right, oh, so. I, I didn't mean that. But I mean, you were ahead of the time. Yeah, that's right. The curve and everything. Yeah. Yes, thank you so much. You know, but nowadays, aside from credit cards, there are many other ways of buying things now and then paying for them later. Some of these credit facilities are interest-free, but you have to pay up in installments. And today we're going to hear more about the allure of the always sounds good, buy now, pay later proposition, what pitfalls to avoid, how one company is promoting this service responsibly. Joining us now are co-founders of Hula a leading buy now, pay later company in Asia. And Hula was founded by payment industry veterans from companies such as WorldPay and Visa back in 2018. And they are our guest, Stuart Thornton, who is CEO and co-founder, as well as his co-founder, Arvind Singh, who is the COO of Hula. Stuart, Arvind, thank you for joining us today on CNA 938. A pleasure. Lovely to meet you. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Now, many of us grew up in, in homes where values like responsible buying behavior, working hard, only buying things that you can afford uh, was preached. Uh, for myself, uh, that was the case for, for Susan as well in, in some way. Um, so, and there was no such thing as buy now, pay later options without accumulating interest back in the day. Was that your childhood experience as well? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, uh, you know, my, my, my parents um, you know, definitely... Uh, you know, put sort of some of that, um, you know, that sort of some of that focus, I think, in, in us as, as children, the, the three of us. Uh, my father always remember him saying, Stuart, do you want this or do you need this? And that sort of stayed with me, I think, for, for the rest of my, you know, the rest of my life. Um, you know, my father had his own business. Um, he, he, you know, he worked, you know, super hard. You know, we've been through the ups and downs, I think, as a family, although my, my mother would always try and balance that with, uh, you know, perhaps, uh, you know, it's okay to, to, to want things, uh, nice things, but um, just be responsible, you know, with that. And it's interesting because I think me as a person now, I'm a, I'm a huge budgeter. You know, I have a massive spreadsheet, so I'm sure like many people, uh, and so track every sort of single cent and dollar. And I think that's probably amplified by trying to start up a business where, uh, you know, your the sort of income is, is a little bit more limited in that regard. But I think um, a lot of that up, upbringing has definitely driven some very strong values in, in myself personally, but also in, in sort of setting up this business around, you know, making sure that um, you know, we're doing these things, uh, you know, responsibly and, and having that discipline um, in, uh, in life. Uh, Arvin, I think you, you had something sort of almost similar. Yeah, slightly different journey, but I think really the outcomes and values are quite similar. Um, you know, prior to, to arriving in Singapore, my family migrated uh, from a small, small fa farming village in South America to Canada when I was really young. And to, to make that kind of drastic life change, you really need to work hard, save every penny. Um, and they did so just to build a better life for my brother and I. And, and we saw that, we, we internalized that. Um, and, and there was still that balance though. And I think, you know, later on in life and in, in time in Canada, we saw our parents start to make that type of investment in things that were going to drive some quality in our life. And for us, th those were really two things, anything that would help with education, um, so whether that's, you know, a study desk at home that, that would help me focus on studies um, and the occasional family vacation, just so that we can create some amazing memories together um, as a family. So, you know, those values definitely persist. I think they, they're shared between Stuart and I for sure. And they do resonate in, in the business as well, because, you know, we're creating that way for folks to make those, um, those investments into the, the quality purchases while still staying responsible to their spending. 
You know, Stuart and Arvin, your conversations for both of you brought me back to my childhood. Stuart, you have a spreadsheet. My mother used to have a ledger and a pen, and she would note <laughs> everything that she spent her pennies on. And, you know, Arvin, you talked about vacation and anything to do with education. I still remember my mom making us go for music classes. I, mean, I didn't like it at the time, but I, today I go, I should have practiced a little bit harder. And those vacations, making memories. Buy now, pay later. Or I, you, you both may not know this, but Stanley Ma those little little triple A notebooks that the provision shop owners would have, you can take the goods, but they'll come every week to your mom and go, okay, mm -hmm. you know, your daughter took five sweets and did you know <laughs> that? You know, and make my mom pay for it. So we were very careful. <laughs> no, let's go back to the buy now, pay later, uh, business and services. It can be seen as promoting consumerism and shopping beyond one's means. What would you say to that, Stuart? Yeah, listen, I, I think, um, you know, there's a, there's a lot of perception um, you know, in the marketplace, um, you know, globally. And, and to be honest, I think, you know, there have been some players that have gone down that path and, um, you know, sort of have, have ultimately and, and very sort of clearly, uh, you know, trying to make money out of, you know, people's default. And, and I think that that's, that's where that, that perception, um, you know, has been built. Although, to be quite frank, you know, credit cards, you, you know, we were talking about credit cards earlier on, um, you know, at the start of the program, you know, I think that they were also right. sort of, you know, promoting that. So that, that's been around for a long time, you know, and, and with significant interest rates off the back of that, again, if you were, um, you know, sort of, um, you know, not, not paying on time. And, and so I think actually both of those elements are probably inspiration to us in terms of how we've tried to do things very differently, um, you know, from a, a buy now, pay later perspective. Um, and again, it really sort of super focusing on making sure that, you know, people can, can it's okay to, to have the things you want or need. Um, but the important thing is, is to do that, you know, responsibly, to have almost a responsible lifestyle, perhaps, if we bring, you know, these sort of elements together. And it could be the, you know, the family that want to buy, you know, furniture for, for their kids, for example, right? And, and you know, cash flow is always uh, an issue. Um, and really making sure, again, that it's, uh, you know, people are being responsible around their spending, you know, and it's, uh, it's important to be able to provide the service. Again, you know, the interest free is important for those consumers, because we don't, you know, we make sure that they don't get into that, you know, debt position, um, you know, but, but, but also to do that um, in a very sort of seamless, um, you know, se seamless manner and making sure that um, they, they, they're getting the things they need or, or, or sometimes want as well. And in the day, you know, human nature is, it's about sort of satisfaction and, um, and, and, and lifestyle and, uh, you know, sort of critical things. So I think that that's where, you know, Hula's tried to position it a little bit differently. Mm. And gentlemen, what are the reasons, though, why people choose to buy now, pay later rather than pay in full or PIF? <laughs> yeah, we can acronym everything. Absolutely. So when we speak to our <laughs> customers, we, we, we do sit down, we have these customer interviews. We really want to understand why are they choosing uh, Hula specifically? And a lot of it comes back to a few uh, focus points, you know, transparency. We, we are zero percent interest, zero processing fees zero transaction fees, there's nothing hidden. And we give them a very clear view on what their repayment schedule looks like. There's a lot of heavy communication around that. So before we even charge that next payment, they'll get a notification a couple of days in advance and on the day of, and it's that constant communication as well. The other bit of feedback that we get is that the experience with Hula is very much a seamless one. It is automated, the reminders are timely, uh, they're able to, to use a debit card as well. Um, they can use Hula in stores and online. That flexibility, uh, that seamless experience really does drive a, an excellent customer um, journey, right? So th those are some of the key areas. And of course, we, we really take a strong approach to communicating this responsible affordability lifestyle to our customers and, and educating them through the content that we put out, the, the, the way that we communicate how to use Hula effectively um, and we feel that these are some of the reasons that customers uh, are really looking at us. Of course, customer service plays a big role as well. So if you take a look at, you know, some of the reviews that we've got on Google and Facebook, you'll see some of these sentiments echoed as well as just how responsive, how, how reliable we are as a service provider as well. What would some of the more common mistakes that shoppers who buy now pay later make? Just list maybe a couple for us. So one, one of the most common mistakes that we, we see in terms of first time users, especially is just forgetting to make an installment on a uh, payment on a due date. So mm -hmm. you know, th that is a common thing, a missed, uh, missed payment. And again, we, we do try to proactively notify, communicate, 
um, send those messages, emails, SMS, and, and of course do an automatic charge. But of course, in, in, the, uh, in the event of a debit card, they may not have transferred funds into that account or have them available at that point. So the best path for us still remains communication. So immediately at, at the point of a, a failed payment uh, charge from our side, we'll get in touch with the customer. They'll get an automated reminder. They'll get a few of those. We give them that leeway, that flexibility to rectify the situation rather than say immediately putting a charge or, or anything negative like that. Because for the most part, what we've learned is that with that communication, folks take the, uh, the measures necessary to actually um, uh, remedy that situation. So they'll make the payment. It's just really a, a case of, of forgetting. Right. And what about safeguarding customers and, and also discouraging or preventing impulse buying or buying beyond their means uh, if they're going to be buying now and paying later? Yeah, the, I think it comes back to education as a starting point. So we've been investing heavily on producing content that goes out to our, our customer base and potential customers on really understanding financial responsibility and, and the concept of what we call responsible affordability. Um, you know, our recent blog posts on simple ways to take control of your budget uh, that, that went out recently um, a couple of weeks ago and is definitely one of our most popular posts to date. And we're going to be doing a lot more in that directly to our customer base and through partners that operate in that space as well. So I think education, again, is the right starting point. And of course, the transparency, we, we really emphasize the transparency now, there are some, some rules in place and some um, really proactive measures that we take as well. We actually have dynamic uh, capabilities in place so that customers can't overuse Hula. So at certain points, um, you know, they, they will be stopped from, from making a purchase and we will communicate to them, hey, you know, you've done too many orders in, say, a short period of time or you've got too many open active orders with Hula at this moment. Please do pay off some of your outstanding payments, and then you'll be able to enjoy the service again. So, you know, while education, transparency, all of these things are really important, having some of these hard caps, rules, and really reinforcing it with our customers, communicating it effectively is also important for us to, to really not, not rely just on, say, a passive approach, but really take an active approach in preventing that uh, from happening. So let's look at the consumer and the merchant then, Stuart. For the consumer, how are you different from other service providers? And for the merchants, any risk to them? Why would they join Hula? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, we sort of touched on it a little bit about, um, you know, the question around promoting consumerism. I think, you know, that that's definitely sort of been, um, you know, historical perhaps uh, around that. But we've really tried to wrap this responsible affordability um, you know, position, you know, around it. Um, and that's sort of, as Arvin, you know, alluded to around the education piece, you know, it's, I think that that's really become a, an important differentiator for us because again, and I think especially in, you know, in, in this region, you know, the sort of, you, you even alluded to, I think at the beginning, uh, you know, the influence from your family and, and parents, you know, around that sort of context of, of debt and, and what have you, we, we, that's where we're playing into really in terms of managing that and, and being apl applicable, I think, to that sort of you know, cultural norm, um, you know, here. And then it's interesting, and you, you sort of referenced uh, to the, the, the merchant too, it's, it's quite interesting to sort of see, I think, the shift in, in merchant perception, um, you know, perhaps around, you know, sustainability, but also broader, you know, sort of social um, conscience. And it, it, it's fascinating actually to start seeing merchants coming to us now um, and asking for us to be sort of socially um, aware, and actually, it's a it's a cultural value alignment as opposed to um, you know us sort of promoting this. It's actually coming from the merchant too, and it's great to I think sort of see that um, I don't know, sort of stop short of calling it a movement, but I think it definitely is. You know, you're definitely starting to sort of see that um, that sort of social social drive um, in this sort of space, and I. You know, again, that sort of alludes to the business model. I think, uh, you know, Arvin alluded to this as well. You know, our business model is not based on, on, on people, um, you know, getting into a debt position. It's, it's really based on, you know, sort of making sure, again, that sort of consumer is not getting into that position. In fact, if anything, if a consumer does get into that position, it's negative to our business and that's not where we want to go. So we're inherently motivated, I think, um, you know, to drive, to drive that sort of position. And I think, you know, when you then start to look at how the technology works that we've built, it's mm -hmm. all around that whole you know sort of concept um in that regard right. and then you know if I, if I you know to answer that second question about you know risk to the merchant there really isn't a, a risk to a merchant at all in that regard because again of that 
the technology that we've built and again how we sort of you know manage the merchant how we manage the consumer mm -hmm. you know for them it really is all success based in that regard and um, again they're investing in our ability to do that Sure. Stuart, thank you so much for educating us on uh, the work and business that you guys do at Hula. We've been speaking with Stuart Thornton, who is CEO and co-founder, as well as Arvin Singh, who is COO and co-founder of Hula. You can find out more about the work that they do about promoting uh, responsible uh, spending as well uh, through the Buy Now Later concept. And their website is at hula.co. That's H-O-O-L-A-H dot co. Thank you, Stuart and Arvin. Have a great day ahead. You too, guys. Thank you very much. A pleasure.